the trailer for the Wheel of Time series has dropped. And at this point, everyone's been through it and they've done this and mm-hmm. they've done that. But we, we decided to approach this in a very road to Tarvalin way and dig into potential connections between the Wheel of Time world and ours. The wardrobe a person chooses or has chosen for them can speak volumes and Jordan is not known to mince words when it comes to clothing descriptions and with good reason. The power of clothing is used throughout the centuries, something worked into art, literature, military uniforms, TV shows. In this case, you are what you wear is more than just a pithy statement. There are some small or maybe large changes from the books depending on who you ask. So we're going to look at some of them, talk a little bit about the possible costume inspiration, and just discuss the new look. I think we should go ahead and jump into our first still. It's this, oh my gosh, this beautiful close-up on Swan Sanche on the Amarlin seat, and she is decked out. Yeah. Looking fabulous. First thoughts on this moment. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first? Yeah, it's iconic. It's not necessarily what I expected from Mm -mm. Swan Sanche, Mm -mm. but it's incredibly, incredibly regal. And when you started talking about Elizabeth I, I was looking online for photos and I came across this photo of Kate Blanchett Mm -hmm. when she's playing Elizabeth I. Mm -hmm. And the similarities are crazy when you look at just the way that the throne behind her is kind of shaped. The design. The cut works kind of, you've got a lot of like V's going Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Upward motion. Yeah, it is. And it's, it it is, that's exactly what it is, upward Mm -hmm. motion. And Mm -hmm. it's just great. So you Mm -hmm. get this really regal sense about Swan. So my first thought on seeing Swan in this outfit Mm -hmm is also Elizabeth I. I think the connection is really easy to make, especially when you take into consideration that collar that she wears. Elizabeth I Mm -hmm. is kind of infamous for having that collar style. Exactly. So, of course, Elizabeth I is the daughter of Henry VIII, who has this incredibly intimidating silhouette. But Elizabeth is slender and tall, almost wispy in appearance, if you will. So the use of things like this, like these big collars, these giant puffy sleeves, like this gives her a layer of Dominance, almost, yes, almost. I love that they used kind of the same thing for Swan and like having that upward motion with having the stole be a like a collar almost, if you will. It just mm-hmm. gives like an extra air of regalness. The other thing about the rainbow portrait, which is this one too, I think when you're looking at the far right. So she's wearing this very luxurious dress and she has this mantle kind of draped over her. And I I actually watched a couple like documentaries about this particular portrait Mm -hmm. yesterday. And it is believed that artisans hand painted little eyes and mouths and ears all over this mantle. And the idea being... I see you. I hear you. <laughs> and you better keep your mouth shut because mm-hmm. I'll find out if you don't. In the series, we know that the Ajas all have their own eyes and ears networks. And Swan was the but head the of blue the blue Aja. But the blue Aja is like kind they're of on the steroids with it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, theirs is like the best of the best. Um, mm-hmm. And Swan had been the head of that before she became Amarillo C. So. To connect her to Elizabeth I, like a reigning monarch through history who actually used the tactic of espionage to heighten her level of power, Mm -hmm. I think that it's a really fantastic connection to make. It is. It's really great, and I love it. I I think what we know about Robert Jordan and how much he was into history and mythology and bits and pieces of all different kinds of literature. I feel like this might be something that he looked at or saw a picture and he was like, hmm, hmm. This was part of Elizabeth's tactic when it came to ruling, and this was written by Francis Bacon 
So he urged, Francis Bacon urged the Privy Council of Elizabeth to sow an option or to sow an opinion abroad that Her Majesty hath much secret intelligence and that all is full of spies and false brethren. Sounds like... Jordan, Jordan read that and was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, the White Tower? I, I found it. Is that a it. spoiler? Is that a spoiler, Tracy? <laughs> I don't know. Is it? Maybe. I, like it. I don't know. I feel as though one of the things that Jordan teaches us is don't trust anyone. And this, this is true. Yeah. And we know within the tower, each Aja has their own set of eyes and ears. So yeah. there is this little bit of a schism between the Ajas where they're all getting their own personal mm -hmm. information from different sources. Exactly. And we don't know what each Aja mm -hmm. does with mm -hmm. this information. Yes. So secrecy is, yeah, there's secrecy in the tower for sure. Should we move on? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, yay. Okay, yay. Yeah. So <laughs> now we've got this overhead shot of the hall. Mm hmm Hall of the Tower. And I've zoomed in here on Swan Sanchez's train. The thing that I that I want to kind of center in on with this is taking us out of a modern perspective of how clothing is made with a lot of automated features and mechanical features, everything in the wheel of time, consider it to be made by hand. And so mm -hmm. if you think about the hours, days, weeks that definitely went into making that long, excessive train for mm -hmm. the Amarillan seat, it's power, it's wealth, it's mm -hmm. a statement in and of itself. And when we see a train like this on a dress or on a cape, it tends to get a response out of me that it's something ceremonial. Mm, so like yes. this is not something she's going to be wearing every day, but when mm -hmm. she calls all the sitters to the Hall of the Tower, she's mm -hmm. going to be decked out. Yeah. No, good point. Then we have her stole, mm -hmm. which I believe is a big difference from mm -hmm. the show. Yeah, <laughs> or from totally. The books. Mm hmm and from the wheelofTimefandom.com, I pulled this quote. It is a long strip of silk about a hand wide that the Amarlin wears over her dress that traditionally contains seven bands of colors, one for each Aja. And it's kind of like this little rainbow scarf mm -hmm. in this illustration. And I believe this is an illustration from the New Spring comic of mm -hmm. Tamara Ospenya. This is much different than what we saw mm -hmm. in... Our first photo mm -hmm. her stole is more like a collar now mm -hmm. but I think they've done it really well if it was this shawl type stole mm -hmm. it might have looked a little matronly a little old-fashioned yeah and I like the changes we have her non-formal attire which we only get to see a very small short clip of her yep but this is something that I would picture Swan Sanche wearing mm -hmm. this Color is like an ecru, kind yep. of olivey green. Mm -hmm. It looks really nice, mm -hmm. but it's not flashy. Mm -mm. It's simple. It's mm -hmm. this is what I see Swan wearing. So now we've got the full Aes Sedai group shot in the Hall of the Tower. I've zoomed in here, and I'm seeing some possible religious influence on some of these outfits. Definitely. One of the red sisters kind of here onto the side mm -hmm. has a headdress on. Mm -hmm. And in this photo, it looks very similar to like the Orthodox Christian mm -hmm. headgear that the Cath or that the East and Eastern Catholic <laughs> monks wear. Mm -hmm. It could be just the scarf, and I think it is a scarf, but the way that it's fastened around her head kind of has this conical shape to it mm -hmm. and I really really love this actress's costume mm -hmm. in general yeah every time I look at her I think of the girl with the pearl earring just right. the way that this is kind of like it's almost like Wrapped. a bit of a turban mm -hmm. also it's kind of got these draped it looks like it's draped over the side and it, it kind does. of feels religious mm -hmm. and then we also have here Mm -hmm. a 
gray Aja sister, and she's wearing a full headdress that looks very, very similar to a nun's habit. One of the things that I wanted to point out is on this image here, the green that's off to the left, and then Mm -hmm. behind Moraine, there is a brown also. Mm -hmm. They're very, these are very similar. Like the style of these two dresses is very similar. And I feel as though one of the things that people were talking about or were asking was, will we see similar styles just in different colors for the Ajas? And I think this, and I mean, in the big group photo, there are other places. This really solidifies it. The cut is the same. So I'm just wondering, maybe these two sisters are from the same like region city or region Mm -hmm. so the styles might be similar Mm -hmm. who knows we can we We can can speculate for ages one of the (laughs) other things that i wanted to point out about the red sister that you had highlighted earlier and she's in this still yes um so i found i found a medieval headdress called a henin um okay and it does it has the same structure where it's like conical and wrapped with a veil and a lot of times it can be that weird medieval dual horn um look yeah yeah, i know what you're talking about yeah Yeah. so i thought that that was kind of like i feel as though that that pulls into that it's almost a blend of that with the girl with the pearl earring with the orthodox like there's so much in it it's just so fun i love it the next thing that i noticed is the ring so the serpent ring is chonky. I don't it's like it. It's very big. <laughs> I don't like it. It seems ridiculous. I mean. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I understand if you want to show like, oh, hey, they're an Aes Sedai because they're wearing the ring. Yep. Maybe they want something bigger that the camera can pick up easier. Mm-hmm. So it's not like a zoom in right. on the hand. Yeah. But I mean, from a practical purpose. Yeah. Yeah, this is just practical stupid. Purpose. <laughs> it's just stupid. It's massive. It is and massive. I can almost see, like, if it were me, I'd be trying to do something with my hand, like, oh, making weaves, and then, like, getting I would get it all tangled. Something. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, seriously, this is my only gripe with the Aja outfits, so I don't feel too bad about it. But at the same time, that golden serpent ring is so... It's so Wheel of Time, and I it's hate that almost, they did this. It's almost like the jewel in the center, like the colored jewel is almost more of a focus than the serpent. Yeah. Okay, so moving <laughs> on, you wanted to talk about the agelessness. I did, and I'm I'm actually really excited about this. One of the discussions that we had had was how will they show that the women are Aes Sedai if they don't give them that ageless feature? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I believe you confirmed for me last week, and this has probably been confirmed for a while. They're not going to do that, and I'm really happy about it. But one of the things that they did, and this was in the trailer, and I was so excited about it, is they have Moraine walking in, holding onto her hood, and getting ready to pull it back, and you see her ring. And when we were talking about it initially, we were like, how are they going to show it if they don't do the agelessness? And I was like, well, you know, a ring is on your hand anytime you go to lift your hood or adjust your hair. I remember that episode where you talked about it, when you were saying we just need this opening shot of mm-hmm. her pulling up a hood or taking the hood of her cloak down and, and that's in what the we trailer. got <laughs> it's in the you trailer it, Tracy. thanks you for the time a card <laughs> you should thank you for listening to me again i appreciate it i also really appreciate the fact that they're not doing the agelessness um i think one of the things that happens far too often in tv shows and movies is mm-hmm. you only get like one age for women Maybe two. Really young, really old. But anywhere in between, and it's like women have kind of gotten dropped, you know? Mm -hmm. Like if you're between 40 and 50, you don't really see those women in media like this. But They always get cast as a mother. Yeah, but someone of power, very rarely. I love seeing women with age and maturity Mm -hmm. being the women that come in and kind of exert control and power. And... That just feels better than someone who looks like they're maybe 20, maybe 40, because you know what they would have done. They would have cast a bunch of 20-year-olds, and I would have been really, 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 really sad. (laughs) Really sad. Well, I think 
I think it's nice because if they had not, if they had done the ageless face, Mm -hmm. everyone in the tower would have looked like they're the same age. Yep. And it would be hard to tell who has rank maybe or seniority. And I know the tower doesn't necessarily go by age. They Mm -hmm. go by strength and the one power. But you are going to be able to kind of piece out who's been there the longest. Mm -hmm. And it'll kind of give you visual clues of like, okay, if this person is speaking, maybe I should pay attention. Yes. (laughs) I love this photo so much. We've got four members of the Red Aja all lined up in a wooded area. And they just look like proud peacocks. But when we look at these Red Aja sisters, there's so much pomp and it's so flashy. And I kind of had this similar reaction that Maureen had in New Spring, where I'm looking at this color and I'm like, whoa, that is crazy bright. Wow. And someone that I follow on Twitter, Michael T. Johnson, pointed out that the red Aja costumes look militaristic. Yes. And I would have to agree because Mm -hmm. the cut kind of feels a bit like a naval jacket Mm -hmm. or something to that effect. And it's interesting because these days, red is not a color you would ever see on a battlefield. A color Mm -hmm. like this would make you a target. Mm -hmm. So red military uniforms in current time are, for the most part, Mm -hmm. ceremonial. Yes. And we do see Commonwealth nations still wearing the red formal military attire, The Queen's Guard still wears it. And there's something about looking at a line of people wearing red and a bright red. It draws the eye and it makes a statement. During the Revolutionary War, the British wore red uniforms and it almost seems (laughs) counterintuitive when you think about it. I love this image. Yeah, because you're thinking, okay, these people are just sitting ducks. Mm -hmm. They're just waiting to get shot at in these Mm -hmm. bright red uniforms. So back in this era, it was more battle with volley fire. So one side would shoot, reload, the other side would shoot, shoot, reload. And as soon as this type of volley fire became obsolete, so did red uniforms on the battlefield. Makes sense. And And when I think about all of this cinematically... I'm getting some really interesting ideas about how they could shoot some of these scenes with the Red Aja because we've seen in the trailer they are definitely involved in what looks like some battles. Yes. And we don't know exactly what their role is. Maybe they're acting more of like a bounty hunter versus a military member or kind of like a jailer. Mm Mm-hmm. But I can picture in my head a big battle going on maybe in this forest. The one power is being used. Mm -hmm. Maybe lightning strikes are coming down. Trees on fire. Debris flying everywhere. Smoke in the air. And then you could get this really cool kind of Mm -hmm. shot of these red Aja sisters kind of like coming through the smoke. I I see it. You see it? I see it. I see it. I love it. I wanted to say one last thing about red as a uniform option or an Aja color option. You don't, if you wear red, Mm -hmm. obviously you are visible, which in some ways means you don't care that you are visible because you feel powerful enough to own that color and wear it into battle and right it's a target and exactly saying i don't care about being a target makes you formidable exactly formidable um (laughs) that's for you santi let's move on to the greens because again did amazon prime listen to our our podcast Did they listen? (laughs) Did they know how angry we were about the battle Aja just hanging out inside the tower doing jack shit? This, this is what I want to see in the green Aja right here. Mm. I love love the outfits. I love the hairstyle on Alana. She's wearing a similar cut jacket that kind of looks military in sense. Mm -hmm. And then she has chains hanging from each side gold chains and it's kind of like a breastplate effect Mm -hmm. 
and I noticed there's seven chains for each of oh, one of the Ajas. Oh, interesting. And she looks great. I love the belt. Yep. And I think this is going to be pretty cool. And I do like that this green is a bit muted. Yeah. So there yeah. is kind of a camouflage effect going on yep. here with the battle Aja. Okay. Is this what you expected from Moraine? We do have this quote about her from the books. Uh -huh. And this comes from Eye of the World when she is first introduced. And her cloak was sky blue velvet with thick silver embroidery, leaves, vines, and flowers all along the edges. Her dress gleamed faintly as she moved a darker blue than the cloak and slashed with cream. A necklace of heavy gold links hung around her neck while another gold chain, delicate and fastened in her hair, supported a small sparkling blue stone in the middle of her forehead. So we know in New Spring, she pushed the embroidery aside. She didn't want it. Mm -hmm. And it now looks like from the time between New Spring to the Eye of the World, she's a little bit more okay with the embroidery. It's possibly. either that or she pissed off the seamstress. I was going to say, or the seamstress. Yeah. Tamara was like, oh, you're going somewhere. Sky blue? Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah. Lots of embroidery? No problem. Because, I mean, let's face it, that sky blue velvet is just not practical. Like, it makes no. a really pretty mental image that that's how she's dressed. But the way we get to know Moraine, it just doesn't feel like her, you know? Like, this, the image that's up right now, this Ariel Burgess drawing, this is, like, my headcanon for Moraine. Yeah. Like, yeah. this is what I see when I think of her, is, is this. And... It's much more medieval looking than what we get in the trailer. It this is feels... why this is why I'm a fan of not so much embroidery because when you see a lot of embroidery, it has kind of a callback to medieval era Very. costuming, mm -hmm. and I I think it's a smart choice to kind of have it Rain minimal, it in. yeah, mm -hmm. pull it back a little bit, yeah. I'm very happy with that decision. Mm -hmm. I know that some people were expecting something different. And I understand why they would be kind of upset about it when you really think, like, this is how Moraine looks. It's how she's described in the books. Yep. But we're kind of we're kind of pulling away from this medieval fantasy. I actually think type style. So looking at this image of Moraine from the trailer. I think this is the Moraine Robert Jordan wanted. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we've talked about so often how Eye of the World doesn't feel as much like the other novels. Like it's almost it's almost too spoon fed in some ways and mm -hmm. almost too yeah. close to the Shire, if you will, in yes. some ways. And I feel as though as the books develop, as Jordan's writing develops and the characters develop we see Moraine as this practical, headstrong, determined individual. I don't see her showing up in Emmons Field covered in sky blue velvet and embroidery. I see her like this Moraine, the Moraine that comes in with the dark blue and the practical mm -hmm. outfit that already looks completely travel stained. This is the Moraine I expect to see. So I'm thrilled with this. This this actually in some ways allows me to have both of the head cannons that I want to it's, have. It is a nice mix. Even the cut of her mm -hmm. blouse yeah. has kind of this it, it doesn't feel so sci-fi. It does feel a little bit like pulling back in time a little bit, but then how it's combined with the jewelry yep. and the boots. Mm -hmm. It kind of brings it up to date, and I like that. I do, too. I do, too. <laughs> we have this quote from New Spring, and this is such a awesome chapter. It's chapter 13, Business in the City, and this is where this Moraine one. and Swan are going garment shopping. Tamor, the seamstress, gets pissed off because Swan is haggling for the prices. <laughs> and there's just so many little details to kind of look at. Tamor, the seamstress, is Damani. 
Mm-hmm. And we know what the Damani women like to wear. It's mm-hmm. a little bit clinging to the skin. Just a little. And maybe, yeah. Just a little. And this paragraph is, Tamor knew what the fringe on their shawls meant and the shades of blue predominated. Predominated. <laughs> Listen to us talk. Yeah. I want decent dresses, mind, Swan said. High necks, nothing too snug, that that with a pointed look to Tamora's garment. So she's kind of casting shade on the seamstress, I explaining love this. explaining kind of that her style of outfit is not appropriate. And Moraine is kind of trying to calm things down. And we read this quote at the beginning of the episode. Yep. And we also, if you go a little bit further, Maureen says that she wants a Kyrian and cut, of course. And she's talking to the seamstress, and the seamstress is saying that'll suit you very well, but that hue is lovely against your pale skin. Half of your dresses must be light-colored and embroidered. You require elegance, not plainness. And I think it's interesting because Maureen kind of has this pushback. Mm -hmm. But I do see her dressing in a plain style Mm -hmm. because when she gets these garments made, she doesn't want all the slashes Mm -hmm. that would show Show her her rank rank Mm -hmm. from the house Mm Domadred. But we get an idea of kind of what she likes. So she's kind of pushing against the embroidery. She doesn't want the light blue silks. She wants something kind of simple Mm -hmm. yet Mm -hmm. stately. Yes, absolutely. I, I I want that outfit. This one, the balloon pants? <laughs> no, the one where she's on the horse. There's so much about it that I like. I like the coat. and I, She's wearing pants, though. She's not wearing a divided riding skirt. Not until this photo here. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk about this? Because I know you were wanting to get into the divided riding pants. Yeah, because I'm a big nerd. It's okay. Um... <laughs> So I went ahead and did a little bit of research into divided riding skirts, and it turns out that this really didn't become a thing in women's wardrobes in the Western world. I should put that this isn't global. This is just historically (laughs) Western women. Um, But they didn't get divided riding skirts until... The 19th century, so the 1800s, and the late 1800s at that, and it wasn't horses, it was bicycles that brought women together to make a change. I love this postcard. This is actually from like a town very close to where I live, where Amber is from, so it was really fun to find this. I found an article written by a woman about this style of clothing that developed because of bicycles, and so... You had women who created almost these bloomers that are kind of like balloonish in shape. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. Oh my gosh, that's so fun. So the idea was to still keep a feminine silhouette. So the top is very much what you would kind of expect from a Victorian woman, like high neck, uh, slightly puffy sleeves, and a very Mm -hmm. slender waist because you're still wearing a corset. But where you would normally have like, a volume and a voluminous 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 <laughs> <laughs> anyway you would have this large skirt around you these women have kind of created i want to say skorts <laughs> is that yeah, still a it word is. yeah it is yeah they're kind of tight around the leg but mm-hmm. it balloons out so yeah. if you were Standing with your legs together, it would still look like a skirt. Yeah, like you were wearing – and shorter. These are about knee length. Like they don't go mm-hmm. to the floor like most Victorian period dresses would, which is what's different about what Moraine is wearing. And actually this particular style that she's wearing, if I'm not mistaken, this developed more for horse riding. So the outfit for this is called – a stride aside, one of the things that has kind of bent my brain a little around divided skirts for riding and Robert Jordan is this. 
there is a slight connection between divided writing skirts and women suffrage, especially in the late 19th century in the UK and in the United States. And so the idea of giving women divided writing skirts also gives them their independence in a way that having just a regular skirt kind of takes away. So before mm-hmm. you had a dividing riding skirt, women either didn't ride at all or they rode side saddle. And I'm sorry, I've seen videos. Ouch. I Ouch. know, right? It wasn't until the I'm, it wasn't until the 19th century that they actually finally invented a saddle for side saddle riding. That's a long ass Ow. time, right? So mm-hmm. I just I. I don't know if this is Jordan's way of giving women their independence while still keeping them in a feminine Mm -hmm. silhouette. Like, I feel it's important. I love those divided riding skirts. But it's really, like, American. You do see when she's actually riding Mm -hmm. the horse, though, she's wearing pants, not divided riding skirts. So I think it's really interesting that we get the shot of her kind of looking over Tarvalin in these ballooned riding pants and they're a bit sodden. They look dirty. It looks like yeah. she's been traveling. Yeah. And then we have this other photo of her riding the horse, but she's got pants on. So yeah. maybe she has many options for horseback riding. I love this. I can see what this must look like when she's on horseback wearing I, w- I this. want this whole outfit. I'm not going to lie. Right? I don't know what I would ever wear it to, but I want it. I um, need recordings? It. You just wear it to <laughs> yeah. recordings from now on. I thought right, that was right. obvious. <laughs> mm-hmm. is, is it women's independence or is it? We, I see, I, this is a good question because we don't, we've got what Robert Jordan wrote in the books. Mm-hmm. We now get to see how it's been interpreted and what other designers are coming up with and how they can make Robert Jordan's world a little bit more accessible in the TV show. Absolutely. Because honestly, if you're an actress, you don't want to be wearing something very uncomfortable every season. Right, getting over put and over in, again getting put in dresses Mm -hmm. and we've seen pants yes so it's interesting because there are characters who wear pants in Uh the series and this is a big part of their personality and who they are yep so if this is kind of a common thing i'm interested to see how the tv show is going to make their characteristics stand out when pants aren't something that define them yes yeah, good point. We've got a lot to look forward to. I'm so excited. I feel as though there's this really nice touch of contemporary design mixed with medieval design. I do like, mm-hmm. as you said, that we see characters in breeches, pants, with mm-hmm. like long coats over it. It just makes so much more sense for what you would be doing. Like, if this is Maureen's daily travel outfit, mm-hmm. you know, she's just going to hop on LD and go for a ride. This makes sense. If she's traveling to Emmons Field and on her horse for weeks, the other outfit makes sense. Mike, yeah. Yeah. So I like that they didn't restrict the outfits, that they made them mm-hmm. for the moment, for the character, for what needed to unfold. Cheers. Well done. We are going to do a second half to this, and it will be on our podcast episode. So if you would like to hear more about some other interesting things that we want to talk about, you can go find us there. We'll make sure there's a link in our... There'll be a link below! Isn't that what they link say? link below. And they yeah, point... Follow... Did I do it right? <laughs> Down here. Down here. here. It's over there. It's hanging out with Moraine. I don't know. <laughs> All right, and I think that wraps it up. So we will catch you again on the road to Tarvalin. Thanks for joining us.